Good evening. It's good to be back this evening. I know you feel the same. If you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're here. We invite you to come back and be with us any opportunity you have. If you are visiting with us, two things we always ask of you is one is to fill out a yellow card on the back of you in front of you. And you can just put those on the boxes as you as you exit. And number two, if you uh, after services, if you would just hang around a little bit and let us get to know you, we'd appreciate that also. Our first song this evening is number 166. I will repeat a few of these this afternoon, not in great detail, but we mentioned this morning the ones that we need to keep in prayer. Teresa Hampton, of course, particularly involving her biop- the results for her biopsy. Uh, Miriam Hawkman in the hospital. Uh, Latasha, Latasha and Loretha Wallace uh, asked for prayers. Uh, Jesse Watson in the loss of her sister. And Sue Barnett, and Malcolm was here this morning. We were glad of that. Sue's still sick at home. Uh, waiting on results from her test. Sylvia Parrish is at home, um, so keep her in our prayers. Uh, had a great uh, turnout this evening for the ladies' tea. Uh, so it sounded like we had a lot of future Ladies' Day speakers and song leaders and things like that. We appreciate the parents and the, the young ladies that took part in that. Men's Fellowship is tomorrow night at 6.30, downstairs Fellowship Hall. Uh, We're to bring drinks and dessert. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer for us to sign up for that, so please take time tonight to do that, men. Uh, Remember the youth events that are coming up, particularly Wednesday, here at the building at 4 p.m., hang time, and also the um, Thursday at the Dulaney House for TNT. And so I'm looking forward to that. I hope the, the youth and parents can be there. There will be an SOS meeting down front after services tonight, so let's don't forget that. And next Sunday afternoon at 3.30, all members are invited to join us as our young men present songs and read scriptures. Uh, any young man that would like to participate that's not already, uh, see Colin Middleton. So we're looking forward to that. As we begin our services this morning, let's go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we're thankful for the opportunity that you give us this afternoon, the good health that you give us, Father. We pray that, again, that our minds can be focused now on you and your Son as we worship you, as we sing praises unto you, Father, as we listen to your word proclaimed, Father. Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity when we're grateful for the sacrifice that your Son made on our behalf, Father. We recognize that it was in your plans all along, but... Father, we also recognize that was just your great love that you showed to us, Father, and we're grateful for that. Father, we do ask that you would be with those that I just mentioned who are sick or waiting on tests or other things. Father, just be with them all uh, and their needs and the needs that they have, Father. Again, Father, help us uh, this evening worship you in truth and in spirit. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For 166. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. Yeah. 
kids just a second. just a little bit ago in the column. But 108, we'll sing the first and fifth verses. Jesus loves me. thank you for this beautiful day you've given us to come and worship you and Lord we thank you for all the blessings you've given us and the sacrifice that Jesus made for us so we do know that in fact Jesus does love us and he loves us all Lord we ask that you'll be with all those that have been mentioned that are on our prayer list and sick list and Lord we ask a blessing for Teresa and the results of we, as we wait the results of the test, we ask that they will be favorable for her. Lord, we ask a blessing on our nation, on our elected leaders. Lord, we ask that you give them the wisdom and the guidance to take this country in the direction that we need to go. Lord, we're lucky to live in a country that is free to worship. We're l lucky to have all the freedoms that we do have. And, Lord, we just pray that you give them the wisdom to continue on that path. In this day of strife in the country, we hear a lot of talk about let the will of the people be done, and yet, Lord, we know that it is your will that we should be praying to be done, and that's what we pray for. Lord, we just ask that you help us, each one of us, to live a life that people can see Christ in us and to love all the people around us and show that love through you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Using a songbook like the Mark, the invitation song would be number 702. 702 would be the invitation song. And before uh, Brother Gary's lesson, we're going to sing number 488. 488. If you find it convenient, let us stand. 488.
good evening. Good to see everyone this evening. Good to be together again. And good to see some making their way back uh, to be with us. Uh, I got fascinated by, uh, by Andy saying Malcolm was here this morning. Uh, he's right back there again tonight. So <laughs> we're, we're glad you're here. Hope Miss Sue gets better soon. And they get this all resolved. We're, we're ready. I know you're ready to be done with it. We are too. We'd like to see that end. But uh, what a blessing to be able to gather together. Whether it's in person or those that are online, we're glad to be with you. Get a kick out of watching Joey lead singing. I'll come back to that in just a second. I do want to say this. Teresa, uh, because of the way things have laid out, was, uh, was scheduled to teach on... The Psalms in ladies' class every Tuesday morning in the book in the month of April. Well, last week, of course, did not work out for, I guess, obvious reasons. Uh, she probably is not going to be strong enough to, uh, to teach on this Tuesday, but you have a guest teacher. Uh, Logan has been doing a lot of study on the Psalms. And you may know that if you watch five minutes or listen to it, then you know uh, how much he enjoys the Psalms. And he's delved into some very interesting areas of that. So this Tuesday at 10 o'clock downstairs, the ladies will meet and your guest teacher will be, will be Logan. And I know that'll be good. I've, I've got to stand mostly just introduce and let him run, you know, in fact, uh, now we'll come back to Joey because uh, what I've learned is the further Logan goes, the more he learns, the less that I need to say because if, uh, five minutes turns into 15, you know, real fast. So, uh, so I've noticed that Joey's decided that it works that way with the preacher too. You see, he's shortening all these songs, cut out verses two, three, and four, you know, because, because, because Gary's going to go right. I'm reminded of the preacher, this that, uh, that always preached long. And finally, finally, his wife said, honey, we got to do something about this. And they found a, a little throat lozenge that if he would put that in his mouth and when it ran out, then it was time for him to wrap it up and close. And boy, for weeks, he did wonderfully well. I mean, every sermon ended uh, in good order and she was so excited about how it was going. And then one Sunday he got up there and he preached and he preached and he preached and he preached. And she went on her way home. She said, honey, what in the world happened to you? He said, you know that throat lozenge that I keep in my pocket and I put in my mouth to time the sermon? She says, yeah. He said, well, I reached in and got one today and it was a button. <laughs> so I will not use a button tonight, okay? Temptation. We started this morning. You know, temptation all began in the Garden of Eden. Uh, and if things had been different, if it turned out differently in the Garden of Eden, then, you know, might have been different today. I don't know. But they didn't turn out differently. They were tempted. Everybody's tempted. We talked about that a little bit this morning. So how do you overcome it? How do we get over? We know we're going to have it. We know it's going to confront us. How do we overcome it? I want to offer some suggestions. I'm not saying these are exhaustive. You may know of something that we could have added, and that'd be just fine. But let's talk about a few things that will help us overcome temptation. First of all, hold God in awe. Listen to what this, the wise man said to his son in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to avoid the snares of death. Now, I don't think any of us has any problem understanding that temptation is basically the snare of death. If I succumb to it, it's heading me in the direction I don't want to go. It's heading me for an eternity in the fires of hell, separated from Almighty God. How am I going to avoid it? The, song, the wise man says, avoid it by 
fearing God. Hold him in awe. This is not a trembling fear that we're talking about here. Instead, this is an awe-inspired fear. Uh, if you've ever met somebody that uh, you, know, you, you really, really thought a lot of uh, because of may, maybe they're an athlete that you thought a lot of, and you, you just, you've thought about them and you thought about them, especially if you were younger, and you finally meet them, and you could talk about them all day long, but you get in front of them and you're tongue-tied. You can't say a word. Well, I'm not comparing God to an athlete, but what I am doing is saying that is somewhat the way we are. If you look in the book of 2 Chronicles, when the temple of Solomon is built... When Solomon and the people dedicate that temple to God, you remember that the temple is filled with the glory of God and, and the priest can't even go in there. It's just overflowing at that particular moment. And the people, when they realize what's going down, gone, fall down on their faces in awe before God. If we would recognize every minute of every day that we're in the presence of Almighty God, read Psalm 139 and see that you and I cannot go anywhere to get away from Him. We're always in the presence of God. And knowing that ought to help us to overcome temptation. But some people don't see it that way. Some people want to blame God for their temptation. But listen to James in James chapter 1. He counters that understanding beginning in verse 13 when he says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. For each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now, I love the King James Version. I actually grew up with the King James Version. A lot of my memory work, and you already know that, because you've listened to me, is with the King James Version, and I'm too old to change. I'm going to keep it right there. Uh, but having said that, there are a few places where due to changes in the language that misunderstandings can arise. For example, the King James Version talks about God tempted Abraham. Well, that's not the best word. The word there ought to be God tested Abraham. God tests us to discover whether or not we are faithful but he does not tempt us to do evil. And James makes that clear, doesn't he? He's not going to try to lure us into evil, but instead we're drawn away of our own lusts and enticed. I am not uh, the world's greatest fisherman for very good reasons, actually. Uh, the, the biggest reason of which is I don't have enough patience for it. If the fish are biting, I'll fish. If they're not biting, I'm going home. I got other things to do besides sit out there and just keep throwing a hook in and nothing happening. You know, that's just, that's me. I'm thankful for those that love to fish and I love to eat them, but I'm just not really a good fisherman. But I remember a day very vividly in the white mountains of Arizona that I was with my cousin and we went to a place called Big Lake. You all would call it Big Pond. You know, because it was Arizona. It's not, it's not you know, Mississippi, where you could have a, a pond that big in your own yard, you know, almost. But we hit it at just the right time. I mean, just the right time. And man, my cousin started hitting them like that. I said, what in the world are you using for bait? He said, oh, I got these, I got these little fish eggs, and they're, they're kind of... You know, they're colored and seasoned like, like with uh, something red, like cinnamon or something like that. He said, put some on your hook and see what. Man, we started banging them out. We had 30 fish in no time flat. You know, that's a good mess. Even in Arizona where the fish don't grow very big, it's still a good mess. You know, you can eat them. 
uh, that way. What happened to those fish? Why did, they, why did they go after that hook? Well, they didn't see the hook. They saw something desirable, and it drew them in. Don't you see? That's the way sin works. There's something in it that I desire. It's not God that's the problem. It's my desire that's the problem. I let it get out of control. And notice, when I let my desire get out of control, as James portrays it, there's the birth of an unwanted child. The unwanted child of my desire run wild, out of control, is sin. And then that child, as it grows up, gives birth to another unwanted child, and that unwanted child is death. That's pretty good imagery. It's sad. It's not where I want to go, but it's pretty clear, isn't it? Sin is not God's problem. Temptation to sin is not God's problem. Temptation to sin is my problem. It's letting my desires be out of control. I need to hold God in all because 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 the apostle Paul says there hath no temptation overtaken you but such as is common to man but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able but will also with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it God doesn't tempt us to do evil but you know what he does do he makes sure that there's always a way out. Do we have a choice before we sin? I think if we're honest with ourselves, we'd say, well, yeah, I had a choice. I could have walked away. Or like Joseph, I could have run away. <laughs> Take your pick. But I, I did have a choice. Up to a certain point, I had a choice. We need to hold God in all to overcome temptation. We need to realize that that awesome God always, always gives us a way out. And because we hold him in all, we need to look for it. We need to search it out. So, overcome temptation, first of all, by holding God in all. But number two, think of your loved ones. Think of my loved ones. The first loved one I want to talk about is actually the one we just talked about, God. Do you love him? We ought to. He loved us first. John talks about that in the book of 1 John. We love him because he first loved us. That ought to be our response. So I ought to be careful in reference to temptation that I don't go into sin because that will hurt my loved one, God. In fact, you've got Joseph off in the land of Egypt. And if there ever was a character in all of Scripture who could have said, you know what, I'm a long way away from home. Who's going to know? If there was ever a character like that, it'd be Joseph. You've got to admit that. But listen to how he responds to the, to the temptations that Mrs. Potiphar just keeps throwing in his path. Genesis chapter 39, verse 9, at the end, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And maybe that would help me in overcoming temptation. I love God. I should. It's what we all ought to do. And if we love God, we need to realize that when we sin, God is hurt. God doesn't want us to sin. He gave his son so that we could overcome sin. Surely we need to realize that our sin, yielding to temptation, can hurt God. But furthermore, it can hurt our mate. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 with me. This is, a, this is one of those chapters that a lot of, a lot of preachers and Bible class teachers uh, like to observe the Passover when they come to it. Uh, because what's going on here is that the, the brethren at Corinth have asked Paul a series of questions. By the way, I don't think they end in chapter 7. I think there are questions still being answered as you go on, you know, back beyond that. 
But chapter 7 is preeminently questions about marriage. And they're very confused about marriage. And you can tell it by the questions that they ask. They want to do what's right, but they're not sure what right is. And so they begin to ask questions. And a part of Paul's answer in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, is this. And he's talking to married people. So I want all of us to remember that God put within man and woman a desire for intimacy. I'm trying to be delicate here, but let's, but let's deal with reality. Okay? He put a desire for intimacy within all of us. Okay, so listen to what Paul says about it. Verse 5, do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Men and women. And you might think, ah, you know, Folk usually just talk, they just talk to the women. Don't, well, <laughs> listen, I've been around long enough, I've seen both sides of this thing. Men and women need to realize that God did place within their mate, be that the husband or be that the wife, a desire for intimacy. And if you do not provide it for a long enough period of time, what happens? Temptation. Temptation happens. And if it can lead to sin. It does. I can show you instances where it did. I'm not going to because I wouldn't name the names or whatever. But it does. It, and it hurts. It hurts everybody involved. It hurts God. No doubt about that. Paul is basically leaning that way with it. He explains, okay, it's all right if you two agree and you're going to be dealing with something that, that has, is of a spiritual matter. If you're going to be praying and fasting, that's a good thing. But set a definite limit on it. Why? So you're not tempted. So your mate's not tempted or you're not tempted. And thereby sin comes. So I've got to be careful about temptation because I love my wife. And she loves her husband, as far as I can tell. That's been my experience for a long, long time. So that's something. And then what about our children? In Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6, we have a fairly famous quotation. Probably most of us remember it. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. Do you notice something about that passage? It says, train up. Not teach up. How many times have you bumped into someone, maybe a boss at work, or maybe mom or dad, who knows, and they said to you something like this, don't do as I do, do as I say. (laughs) Well, (laughs) that doesn't work real well, does it? You want me to walk down the right path? You walk ahead of me. Show me the way. Let me go behind you. And that's the way to make it. Moms and dads need to constantly be thinking about their children. How is what I'm about to do going to impact my children? If I love them enough, then I'm going to avoid temptation because I want to help them so that they later won't be tempted. Then we want to deal with our brethren. Romans chapter 14, verse 21, we have the Apostle Paul writing about our brethren. And I, there is no way that I can explain to you how wonderful that this church is as far as Teresa and I are concerned, except to tell you this. Teresa was doing her normal thing. She laying up in the hospital with pneumonia, Cannot get out of bed much because her own lack of strength is struggling, you know, just to get by. And I will tell you, it, every, once they allowed me in there, which took too long, but I finally got in there. Once they allowed me in there, every time I turn around, she said, Gary, reach in my purse and get one of those cards. 
Get one of those cards that, that's on the front, got Silo Road, and on the back, it's got the plan of salvation and when we meet. And that nurse would come in, or that helper would come in, and she'd say, I want to invite you to come to Silo Road and visit with us. And here we go on a conversation. Well, wait a minute, Silo Road, where is that? And one lady lives just right over here, just, just not far from here. And, more, and others said, yeah, I know where they are. I'm going to come. You just wait, I'm going to come see you. Well, I don't know where they will or they won't. But I can tell you this much. When she would talk to them about it, she would say, we've got a great family. And we do. You may not appreciate how great this family is, but I've been around a little bit. I've seen the dark side. I've walked in church buildings where it only had a center aisle. There was no way to go out the sides or down the sides. and out the, You had to go down the center aisle. Literally, I've been in a church building where if this side stood up and started out, this side would stay seated until they left. That's not much of a family, is it? That's not where I want to be. But this church, this church is family-oriented. Love one another. Be, that being the case, listen to Paul. Romans 14, 21, It is good neither eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. If I'm going to, I don't need to overcome temptation for the sake of my brother because I love him. And so how are we going to overcome temptation? Well, the second way I see is think of loved ones. But then choose friends wisely. Friends make a huge difference in this area of temptation. Look at Exodus Chapter 34, verse 12, here's God through Moses speaking to the children of Israel. He's anticipating the day when they will enter into the promised land and listen to part of what God said. Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. Did you ever stop to think that marriage is a covenant? The wisest man in all the world, other than Jesus Christ, Solomon, made a covenant with who? The daughter of Pharaoh in Egypt. He married her. How did that impact the wisest man on the face of the earth? I'll tell you. When he gets old, God chastises him because of what he's done. He strayed. We've got to be careful about those with whom we make friendships or more, even closer, marriage relationships. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, the Apostle Paul is writing to a church that's struggling with the concept of resurrection? I mean, isn't that kind of strange to think about? How, what, what is a core, a central part of teaching of the gospel? Is it the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus? Isn't that a part of how everybody was ultimately converted here they were, a people, and Paul tells them, I preach to you what? Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. He's buried and he's raised again the third day according to the Scripture. And they come along, what do they not believe? In the resurrection. And Paul says, That's, you can't do that. You know, it won't work. It ruins your faith. Well, how did that come about? Well, if you read close in the chapter, you can tell. False teachers have come in. And they're teaching that there is no resurrection of the dead. And they have convinced a bunch of people. Paul says, be not deceived. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. In this case, evil companionships have corrupted their view of, of all things, the gospel. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, he comes back to that subject again. This time he says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? We've got to be careful who we associate with. Let me promise you, the people you associate with can determine or help determine what you're going to end up doing. If they're always getting into mischief, chances are you're going to be with them. If that's your close friends, if they're the people that you relate to, they're likely going to lead you down the road, whatever road they're getting into. Uh, I can tell you tales, and you can tell me some, I imagine. Children, young people went out to teepee houses, you know, <laughs> things like that. And then they, you know, they went the next step, and they threw eggs, and they went the next step, and they threw rocks or whatever. How does that happen? It's friendships. That's how it happens. Friend does it, and... You know, now you're in a position where the only way you feel like you can keep your friend is do what he did. Be careful about the friends you associate with. We've got, we can't leave the world. Jesus actually included that in his prayer in John chapter 17. We're not going to leave the world. We've got, we got to live in the world. But we don't have to let the world, so to speak, live in us. There's an old saying that goes something like this. It's fine for the boat to be in the water. It's not fine for the water to be in the boat. Well, when you think about this, this idea, you've got to realize it works the same way. It's fine for me to associate with people of the world. I've got to, to live here. But I don't have to let them be central in my life. They will lead me astray. If I want to overcome temptation, I've got to choose friends carefully. And then I've got to fill my mind, fill your mind with good things. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, or 2 Corinthians 10, excuse me. Paul continues talking to them about these very important matters. And in verse 5, he says, Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You've got to be careful what you put in your mind. Years ago, I knew a, a brilliant, still know him, by the way, brilliant, brilliant young man. He, he, he must read at an unbelievable pace. I mean, just beyond anything. And he retains it. Maybe he's got one of those photographic memories. I've got one, but I lost all the film. <laughs> so so I, I can't do what he could do. But he, man, he could read. He could, he could knock it down. And he got through reading, you know, lots and lots of the great brotherhood publications. And so what did he start? He wanted to keep reading. He wanted to read about religion. So he started reading about this one and that one and the other one. Uh, all these different thinkers uh, who don't think correctly about the word of God. And guess what happened to him? Next thing I know, he's going down that same road. He'd come in. And, and talk to me after service. And he said, what do you think about? And he said, he, finally, I just said, where are you getting all this stuff from? He said, well, it's the reading I'm doing. Well, you might be reading the wrong thing. What are you and your children reading? I've made it a habit in my preaching career, and lately I hadn't heard of a particular series that works this way, but I, let's just go back a number of years. The Left Behind series became really popular. I didn't want to spend money to buy it, but I thought, I really ought to read that. And one good sister said, you want to read that thing? I, I said, well, yeah, I'd kind of like to know what they're teaching. She said, you can read mine. I said, ma'am, you, you, you do not want me to read yours. I said, I write all over it. I underline, I highlight. And she said, that's exactly what I want you to do. Take that thing apart at the seams. 
Okay. I read about six volumes of that. And when you get to about number six, it's like, it's like eating sawdust. If they're not really well written, okay? And they get worse as they go. But I did read that many. I know what they're thinking is. I got the concept of what they, of what they were doing. Why did I do that? Because I needed to help the brethren deal with it. And we literally, I preached 21 sermons on the book of Revelation in a row to demonstrate what it was it really talking about. And it was not talking about, is not talking about what's in the Left Behind series. Everybody started saying, our children are reading Harry Potter. And oh, it's full of wickedness. I read them all but the last one. I haven't gotten through with that. I've still got, I've got it. Just hadn't never gotten through with it. So some of the children told me, told me what the last one, you know, did. And I said, okay, well, eventually I'll get around to it, you know, but, but I've kind of heard the story. So, but I read it. What was I doing? I was looking to see what's in there. Uh, is, is it, is it really as bad as they say? And if so, what areas are bad and what can we teach and what can we talk? What are your children reading? When my children were growing up, I listened to the same radio stations they did. I hated that music. Derek Broom, bless his heart, he listened to the same junk. That, that, uh, <laughs> do what? You, I, yeah, I, he doesn't do it now. He did back then, okay? Back then, okay? That, I, but why did I listen to it? I want to know what they're hearing. You ought to listen to Teresa someday tell the story about her daddy. Because some of her friends were going to go to a, to a concert. And she said, Dad, I think I, I'm going to go over here to so-and-so concert with my friends. And she said, I, he said, I don't think so. And she said, well, why not? And he began to tell her all about what this particular artist did. And she just kind of turned green and said, no, I don't believe I'll go. See, brethren... You need to know what your children are thinking about. What's going in their minds? Because you've got to be able to answer it. You've got to be able to respond to it. You've got to be able to help them deal with it. We need to watch out what we're putting in our minds. Listen to Paul, Philippians chapter 4. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage. You've heard it read numbers of times. Pick up at verse 8. Of Philippians 4, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. What's Paul saying? Fill your mind up with good things. Think about the good things. And you know, when, you, when they did, guess what's going to happen? They're going to live like Paul. <laughs> Imitate me. Because what did he do? Filled his mind up with the good things. How are we going to overcome temptation? Well, as I said at the outset, you may have other things that you can say. But for me, I would say, first of all, hold God in awe. Secondly, Think of your loved ones before you go down that road. Third, choose your friends carefully. And then fourth, fill your mind with good things. Now, all of that is of no value if you've not come out of the world. Now, I'm not talking about you left the world. We already said that's not possible. But have you come out of the world? Have you left sin behind? For the Christian who has stumbled and gone back into sin, John says the way to come out again is to confess your sins before God and pray. He'll forgive you. He's made that promise. For those who are outside of Christ, the way to come out of sin, well, it's what they said on the day of Pentecost when they were cut to the heart and cried out and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? The answer is repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How do you start down the right road? 
so that you can then begin to avoid temptation. This is how you do it. We plead with you. Come now while we say.
Shall we pray? Dear and Father, we come this time. Thank you for this beautiful day you've blessed us with to come worship you in song and praises and study your word. Lord, be with us this week as we take the lessons that Gary brought before us, the, the powerful missions, message of temptation. Lord, Lord, be, be with us that we're personally, it, it's the friends of the world that it, it causes temptations a good bit, Lord. Give us the strength to overcome them, Lord. Lord, come this time, ask you to please be with our servicemen and women and our first responders. Protect them, Lord. And Lord, this time, give our leaders the wisdom to, to do what is right and lead our nation in the right direction. Lord, be with us till we meet again, Lord. This I pray in your son's name, Christ Jesus. Amen.